All right, so, taking a break from Megaton. You know what? Let's go find some games to review on this break a little bit. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, let me see what we got here. Uh, definitely gonna be Agile Chain. That one was a really fun game. Platinum Games exclusive, you know. I also gotta beat that soon. Uh, let's see. Xbox. Uh, we'll go back to that one. PlayStation 2 and PS1. Definitely not gonna do because I got retrospect for all of them bitches. Uh, what about N64? What about N64? Uh, Paper Mario? Uh, nah. Star Fox 64? Nah. The Golden Eye 77? Hmm. Tempted, but not really, not really. Uh, Pokemon Snap? Great game. Uh, WrestleMania 2000? Uh, I do not remember having that one. Uh, you know what? Fuck it. We're gonna take a risk here. Let's do Cyberpunk. Oh, shit. There we go. Gotta take a risk sometime, you know? Alright. Okay, so. Got my two games. Dope. I just need two more. Just need two more. What else should I review? Hmm? Hello? Yeah, uh. Currently taking a break from the Mega 10 Marathon right now just to review a couple games I want. So, you know. Just chilling, vibing, doing all that. Hey, by the way, you got any games I should uh, review until then? Wait. Soul Hackers 2 comes out next month? Oh, fuck, wait a minute, what's today? In 1995, Atlas released Devil Summoner for the Sega Saturn, and wait, hold up. Oh shit, that's the wrong. Wait, actually, wait. No, let's take a step back in the past real quick. So to go in more detail about some of the stuff that I brought up in the Nocturne video, after the release of F, Koji Okada and his team had no clue on how they would go about making the third mainline game. So being inspired by detective novels created by Raymond Chandler and the more grounded and small scale story of F gave birth to Devil Summer, with it being a success and it even got its own TV show, which... Oh! The success of this game eventually led to again a sequel, which began development in 1996, with the main inspiration for it involving the internet boom that happened during the time and the possible danger that can arise from it. This premise would eventually give birth to the sequel, Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. Soul Hackers was released on the Sega Saturn in 1997, with it later getting a PlayStation support in 1999. The game has you playing as a hacker in a technologically advanced Amami City, and after hacking your way to get a membership to Paradigm X and using a gun type PC that releases a demon named Nemissa, you and your friends begin investigating the recent string of demonic occurrences happening across the city. And if there is one glaring thing you can instantly notice with Soul Hackers, it's the game's cyberpunk aesthetic as well as having a cast who are all hackers. Now this is in contrast to the first Devil Summoner which was the epitome of a detective story. Now granted, while the cyberpunk aesthetic in hackers isn't really new in stories nowadays, the way Soul Hackers uses it is cool and somewhat feels a little meta, just a little bit, when you compare some of the subject matter in the game to what we see today. Um, but just without the whole soul sucking shit. Now, originally this game was a Japanese exclusive, with attempts being made to localize it, but ultimately the plans ended up falling through. However, in 2012, Atlas announced that Soul Hackers was being remastered for the 3DS and that we in the US didn't get it until April 16th, 2013. With the overall reception of it being uh, mixed, kinda? Generally, a lot of people like the game. There are, of course, people who enjoy this game for its battle, story, and atmosphere, while others who didn't were criticizing the music and dungeon design in the story, too. As for me, though, I actually been wanting to play this game ever since it came out on the 3DS a couple years back. But, uh, I ended up giving away my 3DS before I could ever do it. So, yeah. I'm still kicking myself in the ass for that one. Nonetheless, I am excited to see what this game has to offer, but before we begin, uh, prepare for any and all criticisms about this game, because unlike most of the games I've reviewed, this one is one I have a lot to say about it that's gonna throw some people off. And if we're gonna start anywhere with these criticisms, let's start with that story. The game takes place in Obami City, a harbor town that recently got a massive technological renovation by Algonsoft with the support of the Vice Minister of Japan, Nishi and their goal is to make a city that represents what the future will look like. From here we meet our main character and his friend Hitomi who are hacking their way to get early access to Paradigm X, a virtual city developed by Alconsoft that has everything and anything you can imagine. While doing this they come across a mysterious being who warns them that they're in danger. After some combos with her family, we meet up with the Spookies, a group of hackers within the Mami City being led by Masahiro Sakurai. And no, we're not talking about this Sakurai, don't worry, I got confused as fuck when I found this out. 
Also, you know what? While I'm thinking about it, I'm also gonna make this naming shit easier. We're just gonna call all the members of the Spookies by their code names. In this case, Sakurai's code name is Spooky. Cool, cool. During a convo with Spooky, he shows us this gun that weirdly enough functions as a PC, and ever since he got in it, he's been followed around the city. After he steps out, we do some exploring around Paradigm X, learning more about the virtual city and the people behind it being Nishi and Kodokura, the CEO of Algonsoft. And just as we're about to leave, some weird shit starts to pop off and we almost get our fucking souls taken, but we're later saved by Kina, the mysterious being that warned us in the beginning of the game. He explains further that the city and everyone in it is in danger, with him alluding to something bigger that's happening in the city. So in order to solve the issue arising, we have to go on a couple vision quests and relive the memories of those connected to this danger. The first quest involves a summoner named Urabe, whose task was stealing a file from Algonsov. In order to do so, he ends up getting rid of all of his demons and uploads the files to his comp. After doing so, he is encountered by Finnegan, who chases him throughout the building and before dying, Urbe places a password on said comp and draws it before dying, with the comp that was drawn being the same one that Spooky would eventually end up coming across. Also, by the way, we're going to be calling the gun type PC a gump. Why? Because I do not want to keep on repeating gun type PC throughout this whole entire story synopsis. So yeah, just make it easy ourselves. Cool, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, great, let's continue on. After the vision quest, we end up putting in the password and later unleash a ball of light that enters into a Tomi. Here we're introduced to the Mista, the demon that was trapped within the gun. The other members of the Spookies, Luncheon 6, shows up later and we get a call from Spooky, who's been kidnapped and being held in the Algon Self building, the same building we were in from the vision quest. We head over there and manage to save Spooky from another summoner named Carol J, who's supposedly working for this group called the Phantom Society. After defeating him, we gain access to a website known as the SummonerNet, which gives us access to stuff going on in the city. And with the Gump, we also have access to other goods and services across the Mommy City. With this known, Spooky decides to investigate the Phantom Society and they're connected to Algonsoft, which pretty much sums up the first chunk of this game, with a lot of the beginning parts in the game serving to just set the tone and atmosphere, which I'll just spoil now is one of my favorite things about this game. As for the events that actually go down, they don't really serve a major purpose. They're kind of like filler in my opinion, and this is because a lot of things do not happen in the beginning of the game besides maybe two to three things. Like the first important thing is in the Astro Museum, where we have to face Carol J again, but he ends up getting possessed by a demon named Lewis, who during this half of the game is just gunning it for Nemissa. And I don't know if Nemissa fucked his wife or pissing his cereal, but yeah, he ends up becoming a problem during this half of the game. There's another instance in our second vision quest where we learn that Nishi is working with the Phantom Society and hires a dark summoner named Judah to kill a demon that's in the construction site of the Amami airport, with him dying after the demon ends up blowing the area up. This is also where we learn that the Kusanoha are involved, and spoiler alert, they barely do anything in this story besides loosely telling us stuff. Fucking assholes. Final thing of importance is that we have to save our sister whose soul is being trapped in Paradigm X from a fucking dolphin with wings and a halo named Snappy, and I swear to god, this voice is weird as hell. Who are you? How did you get <laughs> Though after saving our sister, we end up fighting Mewis again, beating him, and later chasing him down to an auto plant where we whoop his ass again. And after all of that, we're like halfway through the damn game, and if you're actually wondering if, hey, does anything happen? Well, at this point, it kind of does? Yuichi ends up being kidnapped by Finnegan, prompting us to head over to the Imami float and let her save him after a uh, difficult ass battle. But after that's done, we get a message saying that our ID has been deleted, which would have been a great way to provide further tension, but it's quickly resolved and is only there to get us back into Paradigm X to save Six, whose soul is being trapped in a VR haunted mansion. We later hear about our dad being a part of a mob of people in the mall, and after encountering him in a frantic ass state, we are told by Suke Roku, a member of the Kusanoha, to go investigate something called Crypto, which leads us to the Algon Microelectronics, and this is actually the point where the plot really starts to ramp up. After exploring the factory a bit, we come across Lunch's dad who directs us to this building's central room, where we end up getting some good old info dump about the crypto chips, and that is being used to harvest souls, with Paradigm X also being used to help in the process. And they go in deep detail about how it works, and you can only imagine that if this shit went worldwide, it was definitely going to be a problem. After defeating the demon called Shimyaza, the Spookies attempt to upload the info they found to expose Algonsoft but it ends up backfiring with everyone but Spooky being outed as a cyber terrorist. And to make matters even worse, Kodokuro sends Spooky an incriminating email that causes everyone to turn their back on him. Afterwards, we get put through one last vision quest involving another dark summoner, Naomi, 
who was tasked by Nishi with defeating a demon in a ruin, with us being able to choose either to fight Tiamat or Apsu. Now, no matter what demon you fight, Naomi ends up getting killed by poisonous gas, or wait, was it being choked by... wait... Asphyxiation? Being choked with no oxygen? Nah, I don't really know. From here we actually learn more about the big bad of this game, Manitou, an entity that resides in the deep parts of our world and must be defeated if mankind is to continue living, and that's about it for a little bit. After the vision quest, we help Spooky in trying to expose Algon Solve, with us heading over to the Algon's main building to help complete the hack. During which we come across Finnegan, who offers a truce to get inside the main server room, and this truce can be accepted or declined. But in this case, we accept it and help him in removing the seals, blocking the way to the room. But after doing so, and just before getting to the server room, Finnegan ends up getting fatally wounded by the demon inside the server room, with us later defeating it. We head back to HQ where we learn from a possessed Yuichi that Spooky and the others were kidnapped and taken to the Amami monolith. And we also learn from Rei Reiho that the Mrs. Soul is overtaking Hitomi's soul, and if she stays in her body any longer, Hitomi will cease to exist. We hurry over to the Amami monolith, saving six and lunch on the way, as well as learning from Kadokura that Nishi is responsible for the events of the game and is a member of the Phantom Society, which, you know, would have more impact if one, we didn't just go through the last two vision quests where it clearly shows that like he's working with them, and two, the motherfucker didn't already look like a villain. But I digress. We encounter and defeat Nishi, who turns into the demon Azazel, with us not really learning anything after his death. Great. We head to the roof and we meet up with Spooky, who's being possessed by Santa now. But after the battle ends, Spooky ends up dying from some fatal wounds. However, this isn't the end yet as we meet Kidnap in his human form and he actually gives us more detail about Manitou as well as Demissa. Fucking finally. Manitou is a pure spirit that whenever Mantine attempts to mess with it, it gets angry and makes our lives a living hell. In order to stop this, the missile was created as a means to stop Manitou whenever it rages, and in this case, we now have to track down Manitou in order to defeat him. We head into the ruins with the help of Lunch's dad, and we track down and defeat Kadokura and Manitou, when the Mensa is sacrificing herself to stop Manitou once and for all. The game abruptly ends, but soon shows the aftermath of the incident, with everyone in the city packing their things and leaving, including the members of the Spookies, with Lunch going to stay with his dad, Seth going to be with his family, and Yuichi determined to become a hacker. And with that, Soul Hacker story is done. And my opinion of it is that, you know, it's just okay. It's just okay. Actually, you know what? No, I lie. I, I really don't like the story of Soul Hackers. The premise that the internet had a possible danger to it is an interesting concept and reminiscent of the premise that the digital devil story novels ran on. However, my issue is that nothing happens until damn near the end of the game. The mystery is there, but it doesn't really have you questioning who the big bad could be, or who all is involved. Cause guess what? You find all of this out pretty early. You can even guess that Nishi here is a villain, not just from his devilish design, but from the damn 3DS opening that spoils half of the game. Plus, there's also the fact that there doesn't seem to be any sort of stakes or tension in the story with it all being solved within a matter of minutes. Prime example being when your ID gets deleted. For context, when you lose your ID, you lose everything, your identity, money, and anything else you can imagine that would be important. If this stayed the case for a little longer, that would have been a nice way to show that shit is ramping up and that the fan society isn't playing with us anymore. But nope, it ends just as soon as it begins with the dudes in EL-115 making you a new one. And you know, I might have compromised if I enjoyed the characters in the game. Spoiler alert, I don't like them, with the exception of the Missa. She's a 10, but she's always referring herself in the third person for whatever reason. Everyone else is widely underdeveloped, especially the Spookies, who all gets like maybe one instance of character development and that's it. Even then, Lunch and Six is the only ones you can really say that for, as Spooky and Yuichi is sort of just there and doesn't really do much. Spooky helps getting you into so many areas, which really isn't a lot. And a brainwashed Yuichi is just there towards the end telling you that everyone is in the Yamami monolith. Really, to be honest, the development in general is really simplified, and I know the team could have put extra work into the characters, but yeah, it is what it is. Though, if there is one thing I can say that I really like about this game, and I spoiled it earlier, I love the atmosphere of this game. It reminds me of cyberpunk films like Blade Runner and oddly enough, Demolition Man. Don't ask me about that one. And as I was playing through it, I was just curious to see the other environments that Amami City had, especially Paradigm X, because some of these spots are really uncanny sometimes. 
Overall though, I really feel like the writers could have done a better job in making a story that actually has you guessing what's about to go down, as well as creating a higher stake for when you uncover said mystery. And while I didn't like the story, the gameplay... Yeah, the gameplay is a whole nother beast. If you play the older Mega Ten games, then you already know some of the baseline stuff that's going on, but if you haven't, then I suggest checking these videos out right here. But after watching this one, okay? Okay? Cool. But there is a new system which is a staple in the Devil Summoner games being the Demon Loyalty System. Unlike the other Mega Ten games where recruiting the demon means they'll follow your every order, the Devil Summoner games involve the player having to build up their loyalty. There's 5 ranks overall with the highest rank meaning that the demon will follow your every order. But the lower the rank, the less the demon will cooperate and if it reaches below 1, they can outright leave the party. Now luckily the chances of this is low, granted if you know the demon's personality type. There are five personality types that each have different actions they like to perform. Kind demons prefer to use healing magic, sly demons prefer to use magical attacks, wild demons prefer to use physical attacks, dumb demons prefer to just use the go command, and calm demons pretty much do whatever the fuck they want. By the way, fuck calm demons. However, if you do have some items like gems, a painting, and other stuff you can get from either beating enemies or buying them at shops, you can manually increase their loyalty. While kind demons won't accept gifts, the other demons can be gifted different gems, food, and etc. Sly, wild, and dumb demons are pretty easy to find gifts for, but of course, calm demons aren't, with these bastards wanting rare like items. The other solution is giving them items to change their personality type, which definitely makes battles a lot easier. All of this is important in making sure to have demons that are loyal to you in order to get rid of any form of BS, especially in boss battles, and loyalty is also affected with demon fusion. Depending on the current loyalty score of the demons that you're fusing, you can get a demon with a decent amount of loyalty, and if a demon has max loyalty, you can exchange them to get some pretty amazing items, such as one to instantly increase the loyalty of a demon to 5, or you can get different items and weapons. But if the demons that you're fusing both have high loyalty, you can make a Zoma demon, which follows your every order and can get stronger by fusing it with other demons, and at a certain level they can also evolve into stronger variants. But for that, I didn't actually really use them too often. Demi Fusion in general is still the same though, with there being a new addition being the Fusion Search, which makes Fusion Demons more streamlined. And if we're talking about streamlined, let's talk about everything else, cause Jesus H Christ the battles are a lot faster than before, and all the animations are made to go by really quickly, which is a massive change of pace, especially in the late game. And this speed also translates to the dungeons as well, and speaking of which, they're relatively interesting. Relatively. And just like in the Nocturne video, before I talk about the dungeons, I do want to talk about some of the more technical stuff, you know, the graphics, music, and so on and so forth. Which, yeah, uh, the graphics hasn't exactly aged well, with the FMVs not looking that great on the 3DS due to a small aspect ratio. But nonetheless, I actually really enjoyed the environments of every dungeon, with them all being different from one another. Also, the music fucks. Whoever said that the music in Soul Hackers wasn't good has to be smoking crack or something because a lot of the tracks here are very atmospheric. And I understand that it'll turn some people off, but for me it's just pure serotonin to the brain. It reminds me of the early days of EDM. Easily some of my favorite tracks has to be the 2D field music, a mommy airport, and the music that plays in the healing rooms. Now on to the dungeons, which thank god the amount is lower than a nocturne. Overall, there are 16 dungeons, technically 19 if you include the 3 side quests, and where normally I would go through all of them and how they are, this time I want to do something a little different and talk about just a couple things I've been through and noticed, with the clearest being how easy this game is, cause god damn this game is easy. In contrast to older Mega 10 games where I always had to grind my ass off or risk getting got by every boss and enemy in the game, I did not have to grind for a single level in Soul Hackers unless I wanted to get a demon early. Hell, I actually spent most of my time grinding in the casino to get the game's best armor and weapons, which mind you took me maybe about 2-3 to three days to do. And beyond having an issue with maybe like 2 bosses being the boss in the VR Haunted Mansion and the boss in the Algon main building, also Finnegan in the Mommy Flood, I just remember that one. Other than that, every other boss was easy to go through, especially the final boss, because once the Mystic gets Necroma, it's all over, and Necroma is a very broken spell. The dungeons themselves are also really quick to go through, most of them doesn't take more than like 30 minutes to do so until you reach late game, where they're all long as hell for like no reason besides padding, and one common thing with these dungeons are their puzzles, which are cool for the most part, besides the Haunted Mansion where you gotta figure out who's lying.
Amami Monolith, where East Floor has a letter you gotta find, and the side quest involving Dr. Drill, where you gotta answer questions before advancing on. Oh, and speaking of Dr. Drill, if you get the chance, do his side quest, where his monkey will literally do a Yo Mama joke. But yeah, shit, I, I gonna be the pro tag. If that happened to me, I would've aired his ass out like old dog and menace to society. <laughs> Now, exclusive to the 3DS version are the comp hacks, which can either make the game easier or possibly more difficult. Some of these comp hacks include one where you can lower your difficulty or increase it, another being able to summon a demon regardless of alignment, and one where you can see the analysis of all demons. Now, one of my favorite hacks is that I ended up using for the post-game content was the map feature, which instantly shows you the layout of the game without walking around and not knowing where to go. Okay, but uh, speaking of post-game content, if you feel like Soul Hackers was easy as shit, then consider doing the in-game content where you'll experience the ball-busting difficulty of older Mega Ten games. Now, right after being in the game, when you load up your clear file, you get full access to the Sea Arc. Now, this dungeon has damn near all the demons you encountered during the base game, plus it's also available early on, but you won't be able to go through all the floors until, well, Endgame, especially the 11th floor with 60 to the corridor at a time, where after beating it you can do New Game Plus, but <laughs> yeah, it isn't as easy as going through dungeons themselves, no 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 no. You actually have 5 bosses to face with each of them progressively getting harder and harder, and I'll tell you this right now, fuck Lucifuge and fuck Beelzebub. Lucifuge always switches between Makarakarn and Tetrakarn, with him constantly doing the latter, so if you don't have a good team full of magic users, you're fucked. And there's Beelzebub, who just hits like a goddamn tank with Megi Dolan and can kill you with an electric combo. That's not me coming up with a Cassie Cast phrase. He'll literally instant death you if he hits you with Zionga and you get shot. But after all of that, then you have the extra game, which can be done right after being the base game. However, that is not a good idea as you're going to get your shit kicked in. There are 5 dungeons that you have to beat in order to get to the exhibit hall. Now they can be beat in any order and you can come across some of the past enemies from the first level summoner like Inui and Sid Davis. Now the 5 bosses were pretty easy, I didn't really struggle a whole lot, but when I got to the exhibit hall is when I wanted to cry as you had to fight the protag from the first level summoner which Nay fucked up! Holy shit! By himself he isn't a hard fight, but his demons can backhand slap the absolute hell out of you. And this fight was so hard that I had to use the compact to bring the difficulty down and after a little bit of struggling, I was able to beat him. And after the battle ends, if you were playing the Saturn or PlayStation version, that would be it. But in the 3DS version, you have to fight both Rhydos and later, a giant ass mech, who after using the move that gives you the bomb status effect, he can combo it with fucking soulless cannon and kill you just like that. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, fuck that. Alright, I'ma get straight to it, my opinions on Soul Hackers is really weird. There's a lot of things that I like about the game, flaws and all, but that story really disappointed me. As I said back in the story synopsis, there's barely anything that keeps you invested in the story. The mystery doesn't really have stakes to it, as well as a part of it being spoiled in the second vision quest. The characters are really underdeveloped and really... I just wasn't invested with it, but what got me to continue playing this game was the gameplay, which I feel so far, and to stress this further, so far, it's my favorite out of the Mega Ten games that use the classic first person dungeon crawling. Everything is fast and doesn't waste your time when dealing with the dungeons. Sure, the game is also easy as all hell, but after playing the post game, I found it to be a decent challenge, until you get to the extra game scenario and you get your shit kicked in with a spiky metal boot. But anyway, I digress. I enjoyed Soul Hackers for the gameplay, but not for the story. And that's a damn shame considering I've been liking the stories of the Mega Ten games I've been playing so far. So, we shall ask the question we always do Should you play Soul Hackers? 
and okay, yeah, you should. I, I don't really have to go further and say that. <laughs> Again, the story isn't really great, but the gameplay sure as hell makes up for it. Of course, you can play the 3DS version, but if you don't really jive with it, you could play the PlayStation version as well, even though it's only in Japanese. Either way though, you can pick your poison, both versions are good, and go at it. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. So, the next game that we're going to be reviewing is Astral Chain, a Platinum Games exclusive, and one that I can actually beat this time. And trust me, you're going to learn why it took me so long to beat this. Like always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video, and make sure to stay safe, get vaccinated if possible, wear a mask because it's getting crazy out there, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!